When songbirds sing, they sound joyful. But owls, now, they don't look as if they ever experience joy. It's impressive that these cranky birds, with expressions ranging from sleepy malice to psyched up psycho, fascinate us as much as they do. Every one of their crotchety moods rivets our gaze. The dark bib below the short-eared owl's chin reinforces his predatory aura. Only thing those feathers need is some orange tint, and he'd have the owl version of racing flames on a souped-up hot rod. But now consider the translucent feathers at the ends of the wings, looking like a filmy shawl draped over the pointed wing feathers. This fierce predator is also, it seems, delicate. Consider his floating grace, often as fluttery as a moth. Okay, moths don't glide, but you get the idea. And his dandelion fluff facial feathering wants caressing. Never mind the glare, just go ahead and pet him. The short-eared is the most likely owl to be seen hunting over open grassy spaces, and during the day at that. Few owls hunt in daytime, but these often do. They have to during breeding season because they nest far north, and in some of those locations, nighttime hunting is, well, what night? It's all daylight. In winter, they cruise the fields at night, but also in the early morning and late afternoon. There's a word for that behavior. They're crepuscular, meaning most active in the hours around dawn and dusk, like a house cat. And perhaps because they're liable to hunt in daylight as well as dark, they have dark rings around their eyes. Now, we may think those make the owl look hollowed out and haggard, but I'm guessing that the dark circles serve the same purpose as the black grease baseball players smear below their eyes to cut sun glare. Oh, those eyes, those huge owl eyes. If ours were as big proportionally as any owl's, they'd be the size of softballs. Now you can see the size of their eyes. What you can't see is that owls have tubular eyes rather than balls that roll in sockets as ours do. Those tubes give the owl superb vision, but the eyes are surrounded by bones that fix them in place so that his tubes never move a millimeter in his life. There's no such thing as a shifty-eyed owl. Those unmoving eyes are part of the owl's mystique. They stare straight at you, so unflinching that you begin to imagine the owl can see right into your soul. He's not interested in your soul, actually. He's not interested in you at all, as long as you don't interfere with his hunting. So, anyway, those forward-facing eyes, of course, are the reason he turns his head so much. If your eyes always pointed straight forward, imagine how far you'd have to turn your head to, say, check your blind spot while you're driving, or flick some dandruff off your shoulder. To turn your neck that far, you would need what owls have, twice as many neck vertebrae as we do. Birding author Pete Dunn says the owl's flight is buoyant, projecting a slow motion quality, even though the tempo of the wings varies. And the owl varies its height, floating just above the grasses, then climbing quickly, especially if another owl wants to dispute the territory. The short ear keeps both eyes peeled for vole movement as the whirring landscape rushes under him. He might be traveling at 20 miles an hour, so it isn't even as easy as finding a needle in a haystack. It's more like snagging the needle as the haystack hurtles by. But I'll let you in on his secret. His eyesight, superb as it is, isn't his main means of locating prey. Hearing is. That flat facial disc is like a shallow satellite dish that gathers sound and directs it to his ears which are hidden just in front of the rim of that disc. And notice that the edge has stiff feathers, 
which serve the same purpose as cupping your hands behind your ears to keep the sound from flowing past and escaping. Even his beak helps him gather sound. Flattened like a bunged up boxer's nose, it lies almost level with the feathers around it so as not to mar the surface of the sound gathering facial disc. At some frequencies, his hearing is 10 times better than ours. I call his prime hearing range the mouse frequency. What's more, his ears are asymmetrical, and having one ear higher than the other helps him pinpoint exact location. And remember that his flight is silent. So even if a vole is hiding under a blanket of snow, the owl can find it as long as the tiny creature makes noise scuttling around in whatever tunnel it's dug in the snow. When he catches one, he swallows it whole and spits out the indigestible parts, bones and such, in the form of a pellet. The digestible parts are disposed of, well, you're familiar with how that works. The short ears don't fly much during the day if it's windy. This medium-sized owl has wings larger proportionally than they are on other owls. I suppose a strong wind could turn those wings into sails and sweep him to places he didn't mean to go. But it also occurs to me that wind makes noise, perhaps enough of it to muffle the scratching and scurrying of the owl's prey. I don't know whether to call that a corkscrew or a reverse dive in the pike position. Other predators also force him to be nimble on the wing. Territorial disputes flare up between him and his fellow short ears all the time. And the birds aren't likely, at least in winter, to actually connect with those talons. But this is the kind of circling feint and jab rollover action that ace fighter pilots aspire to. The owl also defends his turf against harrier hawks. The owl, more agile and better at climbing swiftly, will usually be the one on top. Now, the players in these disputes don't wear numbers on their jerseys or come up into the bleachers to give you a good close look. So here are some hints to help you sort them out at a distance. You can tell the hawks and owls apart if you can see the underside of the wings. The owl wings are light colored with dark tips and a bit of striping. Dark feathers, by the way, are stronger, which is why many large birds like these have dark tipped wings. Now, if low light hides the white underside of the wings from you, and if you can't see the owl's large head, you can tell which is which by looking for the hawk's longer tail or the white patch at the base of her tail. If you get really lucky, you might get a gander at a male harrier, nicknamed the Grey Ghost. He's unmistakable. The male and female owls look alike except for the coloring on their breasts. Females and juveniles, like female harriers, have cinnamon. Males are cream colored. You can often distinguish owl from hawk at a distance just by knowing this quirk of behavior. Harrier hawks generally fly in a straight line, purposeful, not to be deterred from some goal they seem to have in mind. But the short ears wander aimlessly, erratic, shilly-shallying predators that swerve for no reason, looping and lollygagging. A better name for short-eared owls would be what farmers call them, grass owls. Or, if not that, we could call it the short-tufted owl, which would be more accurate than short-eared, because those are tufts of feathers, not ears. You know where the ears are. And it's not like putting eared in the name even helps much with the ID, because more than 90% of the time, the tufts are flat. If you do get a chance to examine them as they rise, you can see that they are the peak of the upper edge of his facial disc, if the owl pulls the two eyebrows apart, the plumage on the bridge of his nose plunges into a scowl. So, oddly enough, those runty ears end up being part of the owl's fierce face. A squinty-eyed, don't-mess-with-me look. 
the sometimes menacing but always hyper alert look so typical of owls is what draws us in. He stares at every point of the compass, intent, suspicious, wary. The last time I was that alert was in 1985, just for a minute or two. Many thanks to Lisa Seffel for letting me use her vivid shots of the owls fighting and to Mel Diot for lending me his crisp close footage of the owls perching as well as his many photos of them. A link to Lisa's YouTube channel is in the description and a link to Mel's Flickr page is there too. <laughs>